Welcome back, everybody. I'm sitting down with Kerry Bennett. Now, she is a quantum health clinician and health educator who is doing some amazingly interesting and fascinating work on circadian health. Uh, and it's particularly why, why I want to get on today is how that relates to fertility. So, so Kerry, you, you've had your own health issues and, um, problems that kind of draw you, drew you to this area. Um, t- tell me now what, what is your, I guess, um, framework for thinking about health and what is your approach to someone who comes to see you with any range of kind of non-specific symptoms? Yeah, absolutely. And that's completely shifted, like you said, over the course of my own health journey from, okay, you got to make sure you're exercising right to you got to make sure you're doing the self care to your nutrition has to be perfect. And now I don't want to say I throw any of that out the window, but my foundation is completely light circadian biology. What's happening what, with what I call your frequency environment, which is really a way of saying, what is your exposure to non native EMFs? Um, and I look at mitochondrial health, right? So I look at the connection between all of that and mitochondrial health, and that happens to be a huge, uh, that mitochondria play a huge role and circadian health plays a huge role in optimizing fertility. And as you probably know, infertility is pretty rampant these days. And, um, and so like just looking at how to support infertility from this lens, has been profoundly life-changing for many, many clients who have tried everything, including in vitro fertilization. And finally, using this type of a strategy, they were able to conceive naturally. Um, it's just something that's not talked about these days. And, and I think we're getting beyond the idea of your light environment being woo, like talking about light being woo. But I don't think everyone necessarily appreciates how profound circadian biology is when it comes to supporting overall health, including reproductive health. Yeah, and and look, people... We're going through different phases of understanding, and I still think in for people who aren't or looking at holistic health, diet seems to still be the main crux or the main focus. And you know, for a lot of people, that is that's the thing that that moves the needle. Is that if they get their diet right, you know, they cut out grains, cut, uh, processed grains, um, sugar, seed oils, um, and they get their that, that type of processed food, they eat regeneratively raised meat. That seems to be um, enough to to kind of help those type of some people. But what what you're saying is that there's in your experience and in in a lot of your clients, doing the diet and the exercise wasn't sufficient to get them to that optimal kind of thriving state. And we had to look at things like the light environment, the exposure to Wi-Fi signals or, or cell phones or 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 um, electricity dirty electricity to um to kind of solve the, the problem um what uh, and and what, what i want to also think about is like there's many causes of infertility uh, or subfertility now and you know insulin resistance is does definitely play a big role things like environmental endocrine disrupting compounds you know there's pretty strong evidence that they are they are influencing fertility fertility so h- how do you think about the light environment and circadian health as related to those those other factors well, you know, by the time people come to me, they've tried all of those things. Likely they've seen uh, at least a half a dozen to not, if not a dozen different practitioners who have done everything from genetic testing to optimized SNPs, which is usually just completely via supplements. Um, they've done the nutrition, right? They've tried multiple different nutrition strategies. And regardless of which kind of paradigm they choose nutritionally, they're eating very clean. They're very aware of the endocrine disrupting nature of chemicals. So they've completely shifted what they put on their bodies, how they clean their house, what they choose to, you know, use for um, like not even no more perfumes, deodorants, things like that. So I do feel like, um, the, the question then has to be begged of, okay, if these things, if these people are doing all of the things, like it would check 10 different boxes of that they're doing perfectly, at, yet they're still experiencing challenges conceiving, something else has to be a factor, right? What's at play? 
And a lot of people have not addressed their light environment. And as you alluded to before, insulin resistance can play a huge role in preventing appropriate ovulation and conception, but people don't realize that one's light environment can actually drive up insulin resistance or make it worse. And one's light environment or lack of circadian signaling can actually disrupt a hormone that I think is even more important than insulin, which is called leptin. And leptin also plays a huge role in communicating with the body, whether it's in an optimum state to conceive and grow a baby. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, thinking about the average person, and I'm going to give you an example of a typical day, Carrie, and you can maybe tell us exactly why this, this daily routine is so harmful. So they will have their phone, their iPhone is on charge next to their head, next to the head of their bed. It's, it might, it might be on silent, but it's still broadcasting a cellular signal. They've got Wi Fi on in their house. It might be in the next room. It might be even, who knows a lot of people sleep with it quite close so they'll they'll, they'll have exposure to these non-native emf signals overnight the first thing they'll do when they wake up is reach across the bed um, and look at that phone they'll they'll get a whole whole uh, bunch of uh, blue light and artificial light from that phone screen they might scroll for 10 to 15 minutes um, on, on the phone they'll go downstairs they'll make themselves a coffee they'll drink a black or um, coffee on an empty stomach. They'll, they'll, they'll then, they won't see the sunrise. They'll go out to, to work. They'll sit all day under artificial light, um, where there is ongoing exposure to, to EMF. Uh, they'll come home. They'll make dinner. They've got LED down lights. Um, maybe they'll go outside for a little bit. They might work out under artificial light and then they, they come home. They look at, they scroll on their phone or watch TV until they fall asleep. Um, because the screen's in the bedroom and the cycle repeats. So, so I've just laid it out and obviously I'm, I, I'm making a big point of it, but why is this daily routine so harmful? And that daily routine is so common, what you described. And what is lacking in that daily routine is the understanding that different frequencies are in, in our environment, including light, are signals very, very key signals to kick off different cascades and pathways in the body that optimize things like hormone levels, neurotransmitter levels, energy regulation in the body. And when we're missing those signals of light because it does, it's not contained in any form of artificial light, then we are missing the opportunity to optimize all of these processes in the body. And instead we give the body and the brain a very chaotic signature because the screens that are the the light that's being emitted from screens and bulbs and also the frequencies of non-native EMFs being emitted from the the screens and the technology as well is very chaotic and confusing to not only the circadian signaling the circadian clock in the brain the suprachiasmatic nucleus but also to the mitochondria who are very much in charge of a lot of the hormone pathways for, for that optimize fertility also optimize the bioenergetics of the cell and they are very much um very much disturbed by non-native emfs and also flicker that comes from bulbs and screens. So uh, it's under, it's understandable to see now that if I'm outside of the natural environment, if I'm in this artificial environment, it's it just bottom line, it describes chaos at the cellular and the mitochondrial level, chaotic signaling, chaotic mitochondrial function. And that just leads to a whole host of conditions, one of which can be infertility. Yeah. And, and look, I, I see a lot of uh, patients who are having struggle, having weight struggles, their, their weight isn't moving. Um, you know, they're, they're perhaps having some I I irregular periods uh, and they are, as you said, kind of, they're doing a lot right with in terms of diet. So, so can you talk to us about this hormone leptin and how does that relate to something like hard to shift weight and how does that relate to the light environment? Sure, absolutely. So I'll talk about leptin first. So leptin is a hormone that gets released from our fat cells and docks to a key part in our brain called our hypothalamus. And I want people to think of the hypothalamus as like a major control hub. It's where you also have our suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is our circadian clock in our brain, the main clock in our bodies that's telling time. The hypothalamus has connections to things like the, the, uh, the um, thyroid, the gonads, the ovaries, right, to the adrenal glands. So signals that go into the hypothalamus are very, very key. And one of the things that leptin does when it signals into the hypothalamus is what's called energy homeostasis. Basically, it downloads, okay, Carrie has this much body fat on her body. 
and this much stored energy in reserve. And from that snapshot in my brain, my brain gets to decide, does Carrie have enough body fat to be fertile uh, and sustain a pregnancy? And does Carrie have enough, um, like, let's regulate Carrie's appetite based on that. What oftentimes happen is we don't get some key, the leptin doesn't get the opportunity to dock in the hypothalamus appropriately for two reasons that I see in clinical practice. Number one, insulin competes for leptin for that same receptor site in the brain as leptin. And so if insulin is elevated, which we see happening with people who kind of snack all day long, even if it's clean snacking, right? But if they're snacking all day long, there's usually some co competitive inhibition happening in the brain for, for leptin to dock. And then the other time that leptin really docks and does a download is at night when we're sleeping. And again, that can get disrupted by things like cortisol elevation at night due to seeing, a, seeing screens and artificial light at night. That can get disrupted because we're not going to bed in time to get a really good circadian signaling of leptin happening. And so if leptin can't do its job and download and say, this is how much energetic reserve Carrie has, it's going, the, the main thing that's going to happen is it's just going to make the assumption that Carrie is starving. And so what is it going to do? It's going to basically prevent body fat from easily being metabolized. And it's going to signal that I'm hungry. And it's going to signal that I'm hungry for carbohydrates because that's a very easy fuel source for the body to break down and derive energy from. And so that's a typical client profile I see. Someone who, who is, is weight loss resistant has weight to lose, and also has these cravings for carbohydrates every two to three hours. Um, and it just creates this, this effect of the body doesn't know how much energetic reserve it has to be able to liberate the weight and to say, oh yeah, Carrie does have enough weight either to have a baby or actually to lose some, some of that body fat because it's not beneficial for her to be carrying that much adipose tissue on, adipose tissue on her frame. Yeah, and, and the analogy I like to give a uh, people in clinic uh, clients in my uh, practice is imagine if you had a diesel car and you the fuel gauge was broken and for those who are not uh, mechanically inclined the consequences of running out of fuel in a diesel car are more significant than in petrol because it has a pressured fuel line and it, it, it you have to re repressurize the fuel line so so you can't you can't run out of fuel with with a diesel car and imagine if your car's diesel and and your fuel gauge was broken and you didn't know how much fuel you had in there. That that is the analogy that I use for leptin resistance. Because what what would you do? Would you you'd constantly be pulling in to every single service station for, for to to refuel because you don't you don't want to run out and you don't know how much you've got in the tank. So you, you you're constantly um you're confusing the body with regard to satiety signaling when 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 we're lep leptin resistant. So so how does um the, the light environment relate to that that leptin? resistance exactly there's some key signaling that happens in that hypothalamus involving what i call like this sequential layering on of the light in the morning that optimizes not just leptin signaling in the brain but also all, a lot of other pathways controlled by the hypothalamus that do support fertility and just overall health so first and foremost, I don't think people realize this, but when we stare at an artificial screen, that amount of blue light is pretty shocking to the brain. It sends a confusing circadian signal. Unlike if we were just living outside, right? And at sunrise, what I do see when I take out my spectrometer, which is a light meter, you see that all of a sudden when the sun breaches the horizon, you see a, a balanced amount of red and infrared light and blue. And it's like this balanced amount of red and infrared and blue, it actually kicks off signaling in the hypothalamus to act to communicate to the mitochondria in the adrenal glands to make cortisol, or actually to make pregnenolone, which can then be converted into cortisol. So that's a key signal, right? Because pregnenolone is the start of a steroid hormone pathway, which involves all the sex hormones. So step number one is we have to signal to the mitochondria that the day has started. And so then that pregnenolone production gets optimized. And when pregnenolone gets optimized, another thing happens. The mitochondria have to kind of take a snapshot based on if leptin was able to communicate in the brain last night, what at the night before when we slept, the mitochondria have to say, okay, 
how much of this pregnenolone do we need to divert to cortisol, which we want a, at a circadian appropriate surge in the morning, but we don't want it to be too high. We don't want it to be too low. And then the rest of the pregnenolone can get ferried off into the other steroid pathway, the other rest of the steroid pathway to balance things like the estrogens, progesterone, DHEA, testosterone. So step number one is we got to really consistently kick that pathway off. And when we don't have the right circadian timing going on with that, that could be very chaotic to mitochondrial function in general, but especially hormone balance. And then you, I, I always like when people, uh, I always say that in order for the mitochondria to feel safe for them to say, okay, yes, we are capable of conceiving and, and, and growing a, a baby would be, they, they need to know the time of day. So we went outside and we just did that, right? We got them the circadian signal. They also have to know that the food is plentiful. And so they did that with leptin signaling the night before. And then they'll do that if we also have breakfast really close to sunrise, because that breakfast then will also signal, okay, food is available in Carrie's environment. So we know the time of day, we can divvy up the steroid hormones appropriately. And yes, Carrie has enough food in her environment. She's not going through a period of food scarcity. And if we do those two things pretty consistently, the body starts to get in this rhythm that all is copacetic. And then you add on what I call UVA rise, which clinically, Max, I have found to be one of the most important times of the morning or of the day in general to optimize light outside. Because as soon as UV light appears in one's environment, it signals, it optimizes other pathways in the brain. And I know you just had Dr. Cruz on and he spoke extensively about POMC, but POMC does also inter interact with the reproductive system too, and leptin. And so you have to recognize that the light entering my eyes, that UV light, as soon as I perceive that, that gets communicated to my hypothalamus to then optimize other things, such as my neurotransmitter production to make me feel uh, motivated for the day to make me feel like I've got enough uh, curiosity and energy and, and pleasure I can derive from my day. Um, and it also then gets communicated to the rest of the reproductive organs, again, to optimize fertility. And when we're missing those signals, especially the morning light, those morning light signals, I find it to be very, very challenging for people to have optimum health in general and optimum hormone balance in general. But modern living pretty much has dictated that we miss out on those because we're getting to work by about 8 a.m. And like you said, we're, we're not acknowledging the fact that we need those signals. So we go straight from an artificially lit house into our car in our garage, and we probably are wearing sunglasses at the same time, and, and then we go into work. And so that's a window of time that's really missed in most people. And if we could optimize some light exposure outside in the morning, it can do wonders for so many things, including hormone balance and fertility. And then there's the end of the day too, right? That we have to optimize some blue light yeah. blocking, but that's another discussion. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I just had seed oil disrespecter on and he, he talked about cutting out refined seed oils as the 80, 20 of nutrition. And, you know, maybe seeing morning sunrise is the 60, 40 of uh, circ circadian health. I, I, I don't know how, uh, how you think you about know, that. I I think it's a great way of putting it. I tell people if they can front load their light exposure in the morning, it's going to be a benefit. The The light that they get before solar noon, from my clinical experience, is way more important than the light they get from noon till the end of the day. And then mm. it's all about at the end of the day, it's about blocking the artificial light because that can kickstart a hormone imbalance as well. Yeah. And, and I love it that you mentioned that we should be eating close to uh, we're see, seeing this morning sunrise, getting that circadian program early in the day, and then eating soon after to signal abundance. Because another facet of this profoundly disordered um, modern daily routine is that I encounter is people will drink black or you know co strong coffee, double coffee even, um, in, often in their disposable plastic cup. You know, probably getting a healthy dose of endocrine disruption at the same time, and then they won't eat until you know 10 a.m. 11 a.m., 12 a.m., midday. And when they do eat, it might be something, you know, like fruit or n not anything that is nutrient dense by any means in terms of things like fat and protein. So, so, uh, and then another point you made was that you do get a, an appropriate morning cortisol rise. What, what, how do you think about cortisol, which for the listeners obviously is a, one of the hormones that is involved in the stress response? How do you think about that? that morning routine, that early morning coffee on an empty stomach and that lack of nourishing food as it relates to, to cortisol. It's going to artificially elevate cortisol. 
Um, and sometimes you can actually, if you have that coffee before sunrise, you get a surge of cortisol without the circadian signaling. And so that can dysregulate things even more. And you're right, clinically I do because because coffee can be an appetite suppressant. So it's very easy to see people who want to do the best for their health by intermittent fasting, but they will push off and push off and push off their first meal until about two o'clock in the afternoon. And then they'll maybe eat from two to six or two to eight, somewhere in there. Um, but in the meantime, what they've done is they've really dysregulated cortisol and pushed cortisol to stay elevated because cortisol helps to regulate blood sugar. Cortisol can help to the body to make new blood sugar when we're not giving the body any fuel. And so one of the things that I see is exactly the pattern you, you presented. And it's this idea that um, it's, 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 it's almost easy to delay, 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 but it's even more dysregulating of hormones, including leptin. Because when cortisol has to stay elevated to elevate blood sugar, you oftentimes see kicks up of insulin. And that, again, can dysregulate or compete with the leptin signaling in the brain. Yeah, and you know, I talked to Dr. Sean Amara, and we talk we talked about visceral fat, and and the key one of the key facets that he sees is you know stress, chronic stress, and uh, obviously that is going to be accompanied by prolonged high uh, cortisol signaling. So, but by allowing or by by doing that routine where you're prolonging your cortisol morning cortisol spike with the coffee on the empty stomach, you're really making it difficult for that body to let go of of visceral fat. Um, so it's fascinating how we're seeing all these th these converging pathways, all these biochemical and um, hormonal signaling pathways, all interlace. And you know, maybe Carrie, like in the in the future, we can do some more, I guess, education and almost profiling this uh, this routine, which both of us see so commonly. And it's almost like if people designed a routine to mess with their hormones and and cause weight gain, like they, it's almost like you couldn't do a bet do a better job of it. Um, so educating people about this the morning sunlight, but also not eating, having the coffee on the empty stomach, not you know just simply snacking and pushing that that fast off until midday, um, is so so important. Um, yeah, you know, I've seen, hmm. I have seen um, with a fasting, I, I'm not, I'm not against intermittent fasting. It just has to be done in the complete exact opposite. It has to be an early fueling window. So from, from sunrise, when you have breakfast till six to eight hours later, you've signaled to your body food is plentiful. Then it's ready to go into a repair. It can go into kind of repair mode. It doesn't need anything else for the day. So if someone wants to intermittent fast, I'm not against it. It just has to be done in that early fueling window because of the fact that it's otherwise it's going to signal a stress response in the body yes yes and i've i've had some great great success um with some of my patients who are interested in in doing a bit of fasting and doing time restricted eating um uh, in conjunction with something like a carnivore diet and they they ate from 7 30 a.m after the, the sunrise to about 11 um and then not more and incredibly powerful um tool for for weight loss um, and you know it works with leptin too because people, when they do that, they actually have low hunger in the evening. Um, my biggest complaint with a lot of the clients I see is, well, I can't do that because I'm going to be starving at night. And it's the exact opposite. When you've synced up all of your circadian signaling and leptin signaling is strong, it says, Carrie's got enough body fat on her body. She doesn't have to worry about finding, hunting, gathering more food. So it really shuts off hunger signaling later on in the day. Yeah. And um, I want you to talk next about another key hormone, which is melatonin and how melatonin interacts with cortisol, um, especially with regard to disordered uh, light signals. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if we were to trace curves of cortisol, cortisol would surge in the morning, right? Pr pretty much starting at 4 a.m. It starts to elevate, surges more around 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, and then slowly goes down until by, by 6 o'clock, cortisol is very low which coincides with the, the, the sun going closer and closer to the horizon, which is the light signal to my pineal gland to start to elevate melatonin. And so as soon as the sun crosses the horizon at sunset, again, there's there by, for all intents and purposes, there's no blue light in my environment, at least not of the intensity to trigger the melanopsin receptors in my eyes or skin, which are the blue light sensors of my environment. And so that's a key, 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 key thing, a key signal that my eyes are trying to tune into to communicate to my pineal gland that the day is over. And so then as soon as they receive that signal, the absence of light is what triggers the pineal gland to start to make massive amounts of melatonin, which 
not only puts us asleep, like a lot of people realize, but it also runs a bunch of repair programs while we are asleep. So it's really essential to have melatonin elevated and have that spike of melatonin happening at night, especially in conjunction with when our deep tissue repair coincides, which is which is the first four hours of sleep, typically optimized to start around 10 p.m. or a little earlier to four hours later. Um, when we don't signal, when we signal that the, there is still light in my environment, and that can be done with bulbs, screens, the television, what you see is a complete suppression of melatonin. If I were to test someone's salivary and melatonin um, profiles, you see almost a complete suppression of melatonin and then an elevation of cortisol at the wrong time of the day. So that blue light, just as it signaled first thing in the morning, that all of a sudden, okay, we could elevate cortisol because it's the start of the day. The same thing happens in the evening. You can get a second increase of cortisol and a suppression of melatonin, which clinically looks for people like a second wind. They're like, oh, you know, my I was getting tired around six, seven o'clock. I was really tired. But then all of a sudden I get this second wind and I can't go to sleep before one o'clock in the morning if I tried. Um, that's our, that's a key signal to me that they've, they're seeing our artificial light at night and they've elevated their cortisol. And that elevation of cortisol and that re-elevation of all the whole steroid pathway is why artificial light at night is now being tied pretty strongly to all hormonal cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, because we're getting a surge of these reproductive hormones at a time when they shouldn't surge. That surge should happen in the morning. Yeah, and it's again we're talking about the the daily routine, and and people are on their phones or on screens until t ten, eleven, maybe. And what 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 Kerry's explained to you is that um, you're elevating cortisol, you're suppressing the production of the key key hormone mel melatonin. And as you said, not only is it uh, hel helps initiate sleep, but it's a key antioxidant. Um, it's a key repair hormone. And if you're generating all this reactive oxygen species during the day, um, being able to re re repair and recover with uh, that, that melatonin dump that you should be getting, which again is programmed by that early morning sun exposure. Um, if you're not having that and you're blocking it, you can see how the, the body is having unresolved re uh, damage and, and unresolved uh, damage that isn't being, being repaired. So, um, plus, we're, as you said, we're missing out on that, that key period of, um, of, of repair so um that that comes to this this concept also that maybe we could really briefly outline for the listener which is the um pregnolone steel H how do you think about that in the context of what we've just discussed well you know pregnenolone, as i said before right that's like the star starting point that can become all of the rest of the steroids or sex hormones right depending on how you want to call it and so pregnenolone then it, it, it can, it, what I see with people is pregnenolone can be low. DHEA is oftentimes low in this pathway as well. And cortisol, because there's so much de demand for cortisol, whether it's because of being under artificial light during the day I see it, or like you said, because you're delaying your meals, so you get this continuous elevation of cortisol, um, that actually results in the body saying, okay, we've, we've made this much pregnenolone, but a lot of it has to get diverted to cortisol. And that typically shows up then at the expense of some really key sex hormones, like low, low testosterone, low progesterone, low DHEA, uh, estrogen can be imbalanced or dysregulated uh, because there's a lot of, like you said, endocrine disruptors that can come into play in that pathway as well. So yeah, it's, it's this idea of, okay, I got all, and I've got these stressors that are demanding extra cortisol and it's going to then result in the, the, typically the lowering of all of the other steroid hormones. Um, and the, the people think of stress, they think of mental stress, right? You know, and what I'm saying is if you can optimize your light environment and if you can recognize that things like non-native EMFs and flicker are a big stressor, you can actually then better handle the stressors that we typically encounter the deadline at work, the fight with a coworker, you know, whatever it might be. But we're so bombarded with these invisible stressors or just these unrecognized stressors. Plus, we've got the typical daily stressors with work, with traffic, with whatnot, that it's just overwhelming the system. And um, I have find that I find that if we do focus on one's light environment and optimizing that, people build up a stronger stress tolerance for other things in life. 
Yeah, f- fantastic. That makes so much sense to me. Where does the non-native EMF fit in? Because you know, for for the average listener, this idea of uh, avoiding Wi-Fi, avoiding five G, it is almost bordering on the kooky. Because for for a, a lot of people, they might have heard, um, you know, five G is associated with X, Y, and Z. Um, that and and it's almost been fringed in terms of pigeonholed as a fringe type topic. But what um, you're saying, what Dr. Jack Cruz is saying, and what what I think there's extremely strong evidence for is that um, this is a real problem for health and for mitochondrial um, function. So so how how do you conceive of non-native EMF as a as a harm and how might that relate to um, things like melatonin and cortisol? Uh, great question. And there's it's a twofold effect. One of the effects is on the mitochondria and the other one is on melatonin production. And so what I've seen and this the work of Dr. Martin Paul is pretty strong, who showed that when we're exposed to these non-native EMFs, these calcium channels, but also other ion channels at the cell membrane stay open constitutively. And as you know, and I'm certain some of your listeners know that when calcium goes from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, It usually happens in small pulses and it's a signal. It kicks off. It's called a secondary messenger and it kicks off different cascades. But when calcium floods into the cell, there are a lot of things have to happen because that changes the charge inside of the cell. And so what what we see happen is we see mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum have to start to sequester that calcium. And when they have to really work on sequestering that calcium, the rest of their processes can go go awry. And ultimately, as they're trying to sequester and, and control the amount of calcium, you see an, a major increase in the production of reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, including two really damaging ones, peroxynitrite and the hydroxyl radical, which, which takes a lot to scavenge and clear. And that hydroxyl radical, when it's out of control, you just get a massive amount of cellular damage. And so you can picture then, then when that you have these, these, these oxidants in the cell, right, that's going to create further damage. It can damage the cell membrane and kick off a whole nother inflammatory cascade. It's going to continually damage the mitochondria so that they're less efficient at flowing electrons through the electron transport chain to make water and ATP, which is really essential uh, for, for intracellular health. And so it just kicks off inflammation, uncontrolled inflammation, or inflammation that takes a lot of extra energy to control at the expense of mitochondrial health. And then at the end of the day, um, non-native EMF is simply a form of light, but we can't see it. Just like light is an electromagnetic frequency, visible light, non-native EMFs are also light, just not that our eyes can perceive. But it doesn't mean that our pineal gland can't perceive it. It doesn't mean that our mitochondria and other parts of our body can't perceive it. And so what you see with it, a lot of exposure to non-native EMF at night is lowering of melatonin. The, bo- the body rece- perceives it as a stressor and it lowers melatonin production. And so that's not beneficial at all for getting a good quality night's sleep at an, a circadian appropriate time. And then to run all the repair that needs to happen while we are asleep, especially if we've been exposed to all these non-native EMFs during the day. So you can see how we get in this this inflammatory pathway that just goes unchecked and it leads to the body being like, okay, no, Carrie is not in a position where she can have a baby. This is not a safe environment. There's too much energetic demand to clear up all this other damage. So we're going to downregulate fertility. Uh, yeah, amazing. Thank you for that exp- explanation. It's so, so interesting and, and fascinating to me. And, you know, it's imag- imagine if you never serviced your car. Imagine if you always driving your car, it was always on the road. There was no time for an oil change. There's no time to change the tires. Um, it's always idling or it's always kind of in, in progress. And that, that's kind of how I think about uh, uh, these stresses and, and being exposed to the Wi-Fi at work and then coming home and having that, that Wi-Fi signaling exposure at home it's just like you're not giving your body a break people aren't, aren't allowing that, that that body to heal at all and um for some background um we weren't what, what is non-native in terms of the definition of what we're talking about and there is uh obviously a background amount of radiation that is coming from the sun um both visible and non-visible light but what what we're saying is native is what we evolved exposed to and what we're talking about in terms of non-native EMF is things, uh, sources of, of, of radiation that are from man-made, so radio frequency, Wi-Fi, you know, across that spectrum. Um, and interestingly, actually, I talked to Dr. Cruz about a fascinating 
uh, experiment, which was the Kelly brothers astronauts. And, and one of the astronauts um, was in the space station beyond the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere. And the sun in that case became a, a source of non-native EMF. And he developed hypermethylation of his genome. He developed all kinds of um, non-specific symptoms and had mitochondrial dysfunction in keeping with um, non-native EM, EMF exposure. So um, that's that's so, so great. Really, really appreciate that, Kerry. And um, ha, how? Let, let's talk quick, quickly now about. So, so you're seeing a patient like this. They they they're having problems with fertility. They're having problems with weight gain. They're, they're not perhaps um, hormonally optimized. What do you like to do and guide them through in terms of of helping them? And we've already talked about a little a couple of things. Well, you know, foundational is light environment. I do lay that down as the first step. So we talk about what can one do to block artificial light before sunrise to, to make to make natural light the first signal that really hits their eyes and communicates to their their supercumbic nucleus what's going on and their hypothalamus. Um, so that's step one. And then getting as much what I call outside or outside like time as possible in the morning. So don't underestimate opening windows. Don't underestimate driving with the sunroof open. Don't underestimate um, like, you know, I have clients who take a little break and they take a break or they have, they make a phone call, but they make their fo their work phone call in their car with their windows down. Right. So like just saying, what can I do to get more natural light exposure in the morning? I've got teachers who turn off their fluorescence and do they crack open windows and they stick their heads out in between classes when there's like a five minute exchange. They just and they sky gaze a little bit through the screen. Like all of these things matter because anytime you can sync up with a, uh, the correct signaling from the light, your body, it provides your body with information and the body will that's useful information the body can use to optimize its function so that's number one number two is what's happening at the end of the day so i really think uh most people need a, a good a good pair you know and it doesn't have to be an expensive pair but a pair of orange toned blue blockers because when we're filtering the light through orange we're preventing the brain from sensing blue and that signals to the pineal gland it's the nighttime and it can start to make melatonin. So we see optimization of hormones on that end of the spectrum plus elevation of melatonin to help with all the repair. And then in conjunction with that, Max, is like a lot of things, these, these are people who probably have a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, I say we, because I, I teach a, I co-teach a fertility course with Sarah Kleiner. And so we really talk about things like, what can we do to support mitochondrial health? And that would be, um, what, what does red light therapy look like? What does cold exposures and cold plunges look like? What about deuterium? Are these people who have to do things to help support deuterium levels in their body? So there's talk around other things as well. And then lastly, we really are diligent about helping people slowly eliminate their exposures to non-native EMFs because oftentimes it has to be a little a, a gradual process. And we start first with the um, non-native EMFs that are on someone's body. So if this is someone who was typically wearing AirPods all the time or an Apple watch or had a cell phone in their pocket or on their purse all day long, we start to remove those exposures. Then the next step is, can you hardwire your workstation? You know, can you turn off your Wi-Fi at night? Can you put your phone on airplane mode whenever possible? Little things like that can start to make a big difference in what the mitochondria perceive as a threat so that they can optimize their function during the day as well. Yeah, so so important, and you know, you what what you're talking about, and uh, obviously I'll be getting Sarah on to talk to her as well because I think your your the work you got, you two are doing is so important. And um, what what you're talking about is not what no one else is talking about. This, you know, the the naturopath naturopathy isn't talking about it. Functional doctors aren't talking about it. Um, mainstream medicine isn't talking about it. And as you said, you're just seeing people who have unresolved health issues. And it makes so much sense when, when we go deep and we understand what's happening on a subcellular level at the mitochondrial level. And then you implement the practices that you've just described for us and people get better. They start ovulating regularly. They, they, they feel better in themselves. The fatigue goes away. Their sleep improves. Um, it, it's, it's so elegant and it makes so much sense. Um, and it was clear, clear that for those people that the mitochondrial dysfunction was the key problem. And uh, I had a chat to um, uh, Danny Lauria, who was a, a gentleman who had a range of problems after taking ciprofloxacin antibiotic for mm -hmm. eight years. And it, it was, it, and, and for the for the listeners, ciprofloxacin is a, obviously it's an antibiotic, it kills bacteria, but the mitochondria were once bacteria that we brought inside our own bodies. So doing the things that you described, um, Kerry, just then was so instrumental in helping him recover. 
So uh, I love it. I love it how we're thinking deep. We're thinking so deep. We're thinking at the fundamental layer about how disease is manifesting. And then once we understand that, then we can move back and under, uh, work on the, the practices to kind of optimize those mitochondria and then um, optimize uh, health. So so we're, we're almost up to an hour. I know you, you had a hard stop. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to um, mention about the topics that we talked talked about today that I that we haven't covered so far? No, except that, you know, it, it, it almost sounds too good to be true, right? Until you actually put it into practice. So I really encourage people who are listening to just try these things, put them into practice um, because it's highly profound. And I had to understand it at a really deep level before even I was willing to be like, okay, fine, I'll go outside in the morning, you know, okay, I'll wear these really silly orange looking glasses at night. Um, and so and so I really hope people can start to, <laughs> opt to, start to implement this stuff in a sooner time frame than it took me because it took me years to learn this stuff and then I was finally like okay yeah 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 I get it and then the noticeable change in my health it was noticeable energy levels and sleep were noticeable after three days and after suffering from adrenal fatigue and hormone imbalances and so many issues for years I mean the recovery to thriving was short I would say it was within a, a couple of uh, a few weeks if not a month month and a half that I was finally like oh my gosh who am I again? So please start to implement the stuff and give it a try. It's free. It's relatively simple. And I, I, I hope you do that and, and notice the same differences that I've seen with myself and in clinical practice. Mm. And what, what resources or books or um, would you recommend people who are interested in, in circadian health would should read or, or start um, following? Do you know, I, I, I do like to highlight my Instagram profile because every single day I put out a different topic involving light and light signaling and optimizing mitochondria, exclusions on water, Max, which we could probably do a whole entire Definitely. <laughs> episode on, right? Um, and so, so I put out a really, a bunch of just free, good, good stuff every single day. If you're interested in kind of tipping your toes into this. And then if you're a practitioner listening to this and you say, wait a second, like, why haven't I been taught this? That's why Sarah and I have opened our course to practitioners as well. Our fertility course. So we do it entirely modules entirely dedicated to practitioners to say when you see this in clinical practice this is what we address so i we really want this message to get spread far and wide and it has to be done through practitioners who recognize the importance and the need for teaching this to their clients and patients yeah ama amazing and it is i i think as you as we've talked about you know this is a missing piece for so many people um and if they can improve their circadian s signals and improve their mitochondrial health um, so much, uh, so many fertility issues, but just general health is going to, going to, um, improve. And so, so you mentioned your Instagram, what, how else can people connect with you and follow your work, um, and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is carriebewellness.com and you can see all of my courses, um, including the fertility course that Sarah and I teach. I also then have a private community through that website on Kajabi and I do three and a half hours every week of live Q and A's. So if anyone wants to jump into that community, you can sign up there as well and just start engaging with other people who recognize the importance of this and then dive into the information, ask questions. I do little educational videos through that as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, for your time. And maybe yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to talk, talk again because there's literally so much to talk about and we've only scratched the surface. But yeah, thanks for sharing your wisdom and, and, and all your uh, amazing knowledge with the listeners. Thanks, Mac. This was a great chat. I appreciate it.